if not, we shall begin. So you have an outline in front of you. Uh, on the title, it's Romans 46, chapter 11, verse 17 through 24. We're going to hit these verses again. I know we covered some of these last week when we studied the uh, beginning of this olive tree uh, picture, this illustration here that Paul's using, this metaphor, and we dealt with the prophecy and all the verses back in the Old Testament that dealt with the old olive tree and trees in general and speaking about Israel to give us that foundation so that tonight as we talk about the graft piece of the tree, which is the piece everyone really has a big question mark about, uh, hopefully it'll give us some, some groundwork and some framework in which to, to view that. Okay, And so Romans 11, let's just read through the verses again that we're going to cover. In verse 17, or 16 rather, it says, If the root be holy, so are the branches. If some of the branches be broken off, and thou being a wild olive tree were graft in amongst them, and with them partakest of the root and the fatness of the olive tree, boast not against the branches. But if thou boast, thou bearest not the root, but the root thee. That will say then, the branches were broken off, that I might be grafted in. Well, because of unbelief they were broken off, and thou standest by faith. Be not high-minded, but fear. For if God spared not the natural branches, take heed, lest he also spare not thee. Behold therefore the goodness and severity of God on them which fell severity, but toward thee goodness, if thou continue in his goodness, otherwise thou also shalt be cut off. And they also, if they abide not still in unbelief, shall be grafted in, for God is able to graft them in again. For that were cut out of the olive tree, which is wild by nature, and were grafted contrary to nature to a good olive tree, how much more shall these, which be the natural branches, be grafted into their own olive tree? And so, you recall we covered last week really the intent of, of Paul talking about this olive tree and the branches being broken off and grafted in is really the conclusion of what Paul's been dealing with the last three chapters. But it's also to prove the point that these Gentiles here that he's talking to, uh, that Israel isn't cast away forever. Israel will be restored, which we'll cover next week. Uh, Israel will, will be saved. And even in this illustration with the tree, the very end says these broken off branches can be put back. Okay, which is kind of strange for those who think that because salvation comes to the church today or salvation goes to Gentiles, Romans 11, that suddenly God's not dealing with Israel anymore, ever. Okay, well that's not, Paul's warning them against that, saying no, God has his promises. Back in Romans 9, Paul says it's not as though the word of God had taken none effect. The word of God promised to Israel. It had an effect. Okay, something happened. They just didn't understand what happened. And so if you're a Jew, if you're a Gentile, who was not up to speed with Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John in Acts, you would have thought that, hey, God just gave up finally in Old Testament Israel, and now he's dealing with Gentiles. Uh, well, no, that's not the case. And yet, if you think about it, in the, in the minds of so many Christians, that's how they see it in the Bible. They, they, they don't know how to rightly divide uh, the red letters in the Scripture. They don't know how to rightly divide Peter from Paul. So they think there was Old Testament Israel, and suddenly God got fed up, and he starts dealing with this new thing with Gentiles called the church. Okay. Well, it's not that simple. Okay. And so as we study the Bible out in its context, we identify the dispensations, uh, we realize there's a need to rightly divide, especially when it comes to chapters like Romans 9 through 11. Uh, just as a matter of review, if you remember last week as we dealt with prophetic definition and biblical definition for the trees and branches, we saw that trees in the Bible represent kingdoms or prosperity, earthly dominions. Remember we went back to Daniel and we saw a Gentile tree, and the tree was a person, Nebuchadnezzar, and the tree was his dominion and his prosperity. We saw back there in Psalm 1, talked about individual people as trees, and if they do good works, if they're godly, if they follow the law of the Lord, the roots get planted down next to waters, but the wicked and the ungodly, their tree gets burnt up, okay? So trees have to do with people on the earth, their prosperity on the earth, their earthly dominion, their, the, and specifically relating to Israel about their kingdom. We saw back in the Old Testament, there was a, a whole orchard of trees that was, that was said to be the house of Israel. Okay, and so trees have to do with that. Kingdoms, prosperity, earthly dominions. Trees have roots in the earth. Uh, a heavenly body, the church body of Christ, doesn't have roots in the earth. Okay, we have a, a place in heavenly, uh, uh, we have a place up in the heaven uh, reserved for us, uh, in Colossians 1 says, and uh, Ephesians 2, 6 says we're seated up there. And so we saw that tree definition. We also saw back there that the root and the stump meant something. And remember when Nebuchadnezzar's tree was chopped down, uh, there was a root that was left. And uh, Joseph, uh, Joseph Daniel said that that meant there would be still a surety that his kingdom would come back. It was a remnant. It was a, a seed left that his kingdom would return. And so as you see in, in Romans 11, uh, what was it, verse 16, where it says the root be holy. That root's talking about a root, the remnant, the base of this tree, okay, which is, of course, going to be Israel and their promises. And so it was not that God cut them off and dug up the roots and there's nothing there anymore. 
Okay, he cut off some branches, as Paul's pointing out, but the root's still there. The tree's still there. There's still some branches that weren't broken off. So God is, is far from forgetting uh, his promises to Israel. And so that root and stump represents a remnant after being cut down. There's many times in Israel's history that God comes to Israel's trees and burns them up, chops them down, right? And every time that happens, God always puts in prophecy the promise that they will return. Okay, and so you have the roots and stumps representing a remnant. And so if the root be holy, so are the branches. And so it comes to the branch definition. And we talk about how the branches of the tree have to do with the dominion, right? Have to do with the, that, uh, the, the fullness of the tree. You plant the seed, you got the root, which is the, the small part, but really when it comes to its fullness and its fruitfulness, you've got the branches out there with their fruit. And so as Paul's talking about the remnant in contrast to Israel's fullness in Romans 11, he uses this tree example to say, well, there's a tree and the branches is who's going to get that kingdom. That, that's their fullness, okay, is, is when that tree actually blossoms out and bears that fruit. And so the branches are the dominion, the kingdom. And what we're seeing here is that uh, in Israel's kingdom, and of course we can know this from prophecy as well, uh, not only do Jews, do, does Israel, uh, get into that kingdom and they inhabit the land that God promised them, but there are Gentiles, faithful Gentiles there, that Israel rules over and reigns over. And so you can go to Revelation chapter 21 and see that there are nations, kings and nations on the earth, with Israel. And so there's Gentiles and Jews in the kingdom. They have to do with this tree, this, this God's dominion on the earth. Okay, and that's what we're seeing in Romans 11. We're seeing uh, Gentiles being put into this tree of Israel's dominion, their promises. All right? And so th that, that's where we left it last week. We also dealt briefly at the end there, and I hope it wasn't so confusing, about why the tree is an olive tree. Okay, and we dealt with some of the prophecies back there. If you turn to Leviticus 24, we'll see it again, where there's a significance to the olive in, in the Bible, and, and God uses these various trees in Israel, in their land, to represent different aspects of them. The olive tree, you can probably tie down to Israel's, uh, the, the religious Israel, or at least the promises given to them to be priests on the earth. And you, you get that from the law where God told Israel to build a candle, a build a temple inside the temple, have a candlestick, and that candlestick to put pure olive oil to burn continually. Yeah. Leviticus 24, verse 2, command the children of Israel that they bring unto thee pure oil olive beaten for the light to cause the lamps to burn continually. Without the veil of the testimony in the tabernacle of the congregation shall Aaron order it from the evening unto the morning before the Lord continually. It shall be a statute forever in your generations. What's that speak to? The everlasting aspect of God's promises to Israel. Okay, he says you're going to do this forever. Right? There's going to be a light burning forever. What, what burns that light? The olive oil. Right? You look over in the kingdom, of course these things are all types of the things to come. The shadows of things to come that Paul talks about. The things to come are going to be that city, that kingdom, that light on a hill where, hey, there doesn't need to be a sun there anymore because, you know, God is the light of it, right? And so, of course, you have the, the whole light coming to earth in John 1 and that sort of thing. There's prophetic meaning to, to this candlestick and these things. Drop down to verse 4. He shall order the lamps upon the pure candlestick before the Lord continually. And thou shalt make fine flour and bake twelve cakes thereof. Two tenth deals shall be in one cake. And thou shalt set them in two rows, six on a row upon the pure table before the Lord. And thou shalt put it pure frankincense upon each row, that it may be on the bread for a memorial, even an offering made by fire unto the Lord. So we have a memorial offering of bread here in front of this continual burning light. Every Sabbath he shall set it in order before the Lord continually, being taken from the children of Israel by an everlasting covenant. So again here, you've got bread memorial offerings and light burning forever as memorial of the covenant to Israel. Okay? And so when you see over there in Revelation 21, bread, and you see over there light uh, in a city, in a tabernacle, in a temple, uh, you, this has to do with Israel and their, their earthly fulfillment. Okay? It would be wrong to think that physical bread and lights have anything to do with you, uh, who, who are a spiritual body called the body of Christ. But meanwhile, this light that ever burns, that is a, a, a remembrance of God's covenant with them, is burnt by olive oil, okay? the fruit of the olive what happens if the, tree, the olive trees don't bear olives? Well, the light doesn't burn, right? They don't get the promise. Yeah, that, that, that's how it works. So we covered a few chapters last week dealing with that. And uh, if you look at Psalm 52, you see it again here, where David calls himself. Now, what do we know about David in Israel's history? What makes him unique? The promise, of course, that God gave him, right? Uh, unique to David was a promise of mercy was a promise that through your seed there'd be a kingdom and a king. 
sitting on the throne forever. It's an everlasting covenant. Just like back there in Leviticus 24 said. And in Psalm 52, down in verse 7, uh, it says, Lo, this is the man that, that uh, made not God his strength, uh, but trusted in the abundance of his riches and strengthened himself in his weakness. So you have self-righteous uh, person trusting in their status and their riches. And in verse 8, he, David compares himself and contrasts to him and says, But I am like a green olive tree in the house of God. I trust in the mercy of God forever and ever. And so again, you've got this olive tree whereby comes the olive oil to burn the light continually. And he's trusting in the Lord forever. And that's why he calls himself a green olive tree. A green olive tree, one that bears olives green. It's not brown and dead. And, and he's that because he trusts in the Lord, not in himself, not in riches. He trusts in the Lord forever. So verse 9, I will praise thee forever because thou, thou hast done it. And I will wait on thy name for it is good before thy saints. So you have here another definition of this, this olive tree that David calls himself as being someone that trusts in the Lord. That's exactly what we see in Romans 10, by the way. Right, don't we? we? Romans 10, the, the place of Israel's stumbling was that they did not have faith in their Messiah, right? And they tried to seek it with their own works, with their own righteousness, with their own riches even. We'll see here in a bit. Um, Proverbs eleven twenty eight. skip over to Proverbs. It says the same thing about riches. When it says, he that trusts in his riches shall fall, but the righteous shall flourish as a branch. Now, you read that and you think, oh, that's poetic language. And then you get to Romans 11 and you go, wait a minute. Those that were trusting in riches actually were broken off the tree. And those that were not, the righteous, they're grafted in the tree. They're flourishing like a branch. And so it's actually speaking to the very thing that Paul's talking about, speaking to Israel's tree, their dominion. Okay? They'll flourish like a branch. He that trusts in riches shall fall. He broken off. Those things that uh, we covered last week uh, was to give you the idea that uh, the things we read about in Romans 11, it's not the first time you read about it. Okay, when you study the rest of the Bible and see what they say, uh, hopefully tonight as we go to some of the red letter verses, you'll see that Jesus also talked about these things. Look at 1 Peter chapter 1. Now Peter was one of the 12 apostles. Uh, to the remnant of Israel, preaching the gospel of the kingdom and the fulfillment of Israel's promises, which, again, is the topic of Paul's conversation in Romans 11. And in 1 Peter 1, verse 18, he says, For as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold. And so he's saying, that, speaking to the remnant of Israel, you are not redeemed with money. Right? Well, why would he say that? The people think that they can be. Right? If you trust in riches, you're going to fall, Proverbs 11 says. There's a man that trusts in riches in Psalm 52. David says, I'm a green olive tree. I'm a man that trusts in riches. Okay? And Peter says that uh, you are not redeemed with corruptible things, as silver and gold, from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish, without spot. And so, again, Peter's recognizing the necessity of faith in Christ to be a part of this true Israel here, this believing Israel that he's addressing. Uh, and not those who are in the vain conversation received by tradition of their fathers, which is to say that they're priests by heritage, they're Jews by circumcision and by birthright. John the Baptist said that, that doesn't cut it. Uh, by the way, speaking of John the Baptist, look at Matthew chapter 3, verse 7. When Jesus came, when John the Baptist came, they came to fulfill the prophecies which talked about cutting... Uh, off the dead branches and helping the other branches flourish into that kingdom. They taught the kingdom is at hand. Matthew chapter 3 verse 7 uh, when John the Baptist was baptizing in a river preaching the repentance of water baptism for the, uh, and the confession of sins uh, verse 7 says when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees that would be Israelites come to the baptism he said unto them O generation of vipers who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come Bring forth, therefore, fruits, meat for repentance. So he's preaching fruits. You, i got to see some fruit off your tree. He says, I don't see any fruit off your tree. I see vipers. I see whited sepulchers. I see hypocrites. And so that's what John the Baptist sees in verse 9. Think not to say within yourselves, we have Abraham to our father. For I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. And now also, notice it, the axe is laid unto the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree which brings not forth good fruit, is hewn down and cast into the fire. So we talked about broken branches last week. John the Baptist thought the same thing in his ministry. 
Okay, he says, this is what the Messiah is coming to do. It's time where the axe is coming to the tree. Right? If you don't bring forth fruit needs for repentance, there's going to be a broken branch. Right? Now, remember, the mystery was not revealed in Matthew 3. Okay? The church is nowhere to be found in the whole book of Matthew. Okay? And yet Matthew 3, verse 10, is talking about broken off branches. And another reason that we'll see later tonight, you cannot be a part of this picture. Okay? Paul's not talking about the church here. He's talking about what happened to Israel. But meanwhile, if you look at uh, Mark chapter 10, the Pharisees and Sadducees, they thought by virtue of their lineage, their genealogy, their heritage, they would receive promises because of who they were. Right? That's the person that's not trusting in God, but in themselves. Mark 10, verse 17. We have a, another example here of an Israelite who, though he had fruits, meat for repentance, he didn't have the repentance. He didn't have the change of mind. He didn't have the faith. Okay, and we'll see in Mark 10, verse 17. When he was gone forth into the way, there came one running and kneeled to him, asked him, Good master, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? So we've covered this passage before, but uh, Mark, the Mark testimony of it here is a little different. Verse 18 says, Jesus responded, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one. That is God. That's a testimony of his deity. Thou knowest the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not kill. Do not steal. Bear false witness or defraud. Honor thy father and mother. And so he's quoting the commandments to a person asking him, how am I supposed to be uh, saved into eternal life? Which is not your response, of course, to evangelism. But it's what Jesus did, teaching the law. Uh, verse 20. He answered and said, Master, all these have I observed from my youth. And so he says, I'm doing the works. I'm doing the commandments. Now there are people who think that Jesus here is just testing this fellow and using the law to, to show him his sin. When actually, uh, he's not. He's saying, this is what you need to do. How do you have eternal life? Well, the law says you, you, you have to do it. He says, have you done these? He says, yeah, I've done it. And notice what Jesus says. Jesus, beholding him, loved him. <laughs> Great. You're a commandment keeper. You do righteousness. That's good. And said unto him, one thing thou lacks. He said, you want to have eternal life? Go thy way, sell whatever thou hast, give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven. And come, take up thy cross, follow me. Easy. Right? You've done all the commandments. Just sell what you got. Follow me. Give it all up. Follow me. Right? And this is the problem. You can do, you can be, you can do all the commandments and be a wealthy Israelite, be a wealthy Jew. Right? And this was the problem. The person who was trusting in their own riches. You know, because of what I've done, I've kept the commandments. I, I've get, gotten the status. I've gotten this wealth. I've gotten this legacy. And Jesus says, just throw it all away. Follow me. That's all. And he, he said in verse 22, he was sad at that saying, and he went away greed, for he had great possessions. Jesus looked round about and said to his disciples, How hardly shall they that have riches enter into the kingdom of God? And so again, this issue of riches here, where we saw back in Proverbs, we saw back in Psalms, okay, where David says, I don't trust in riches, I trust in God. I'm a green olive tree. right? Uh, this fellow apparently wasn't going to get in that olive tree, was he? He's not going to be a green olive tree. He's trusting in his riches. You see? So you have that going on in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, where Jesus came to divide Luke 12, 51, right? Came to divide mother from father, brother from sister, on the basis of whether they're going to follow him or not, right? Whether they're the green olive tree or the dead tree not producing fruit, you see? So even though this guy kept the commandments, he didn't show the fruit necessary, which was to sell everything he had and follow the Lord, that faith in the Lord, okay? So meanwhile, uh, th there's a perfect example where th this fellow here seems like a very natural branch. I mean, he's doing the commandments. He's an Israelite. He's a Jew. He's, 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 he, the Lord loves him. And he's like, sell everything you got. And he goes, nope, I can't. He goes, ah, you're dead inside. And that, that guy's going to be broken off. Okay? And so that, that's what we're seeing here. Um, look at Romans eleven seventeen. 17. We'll get into more verses in Matthew a little bit later. Romans eleven seventeen. Let's Let's start tearing apart some of these verses. Now, understanding that when talking about this graph, when talking about the olive tree, uh, a, a lot of people, their heads spin. The reason why that happens, again, is, as I would present to you, is that they do not understand the dispensational context of what's going on. They think the only difference in their Bible is Old Testament and New Testament. They think Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John is about the church. We just read a few examples from Mark and Matthew talking about this very thing. And if you think Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John's talking about you, then you're going to be confused because you're going to be taking the Red Letter Doctrine and Romans 11 and saying, that's well, apparently the church. Okay? And it's going to make you, in one way or another, uh, part of Israel's program, part of their doctrine, part of their covenant, which is going to affect your position in Christ. Okay? It's going to affect your understanding of the riches you have in Christ. 
And so identifying the, the graft in branches here is the cause of many wrong doctrines. Um, I would present to you as we go through these verses, do not change doctrine that you know very certainly from Paul's epistles, from the Bible anywhere, that you can read and you can defend and you say this is very easy to understand. Don't change those doctrines that you know. Don't change the easy verses based on the hard ones. And no doubt Romans 11 is more difficult than other passages in your Bible. And so if you took this one and said, well, I just don't know what that means, that's better than saying, well, I want to change everything else I believe, making myself Israel, just so it fits into this tree here. Okay, that's a problem. Because not only does it, does it not work, but these are difficult passages. Okay? And so the difficult passages are always inferior to the easier passages, and that's how you study the Bible correctly. Uh, that's how you save yourself from making a bunch of mistakes. But there's a lot of different interpretations of this. Uh, uh, there, as I read the commentaries about who they thought the graft and branches are, the most popular one is to say that the, the graft and branches are the Gentile Christians. Okay, the, and, and that's lacking in one way, in that it doesn't discern that there's a lot more players going on here than just Jews and Gentiles. They think there's Hebrew Christians and Gentile Christians, and that's it. Before there was Israel, now there's Gentile Christians and, Jews, and Jewish Christians. No, there's not. Okay, there's a lot more things going on there. Okay, and so just to say, oh, they're Gentiles, and leave it at that. Well, which Gentiles are they? We covered a few weeks ago that there are Gentiles in the Bible that are not the church. And so there are Gentiles in the church, Gentiles outside the church. There are Gentiles that are not neither. So there's three different groups of Gentiles you have to discern there. Okay. And so uh, Douglas Moo, one of the popular commentators of Romans, uh, says they're Gentile Christians, and that's the popular reading of it. Uh, Arno Gabeline, who was a popular dispensational uh, preacher about 100 years ago or more, uh, he says that it's Christendom. Now, I'm going to read a statement for his commentary because he, he gets it being dispensational. He gets it almost exactly right. He even says at a point that it cannot be the true church. And then he says it must be something else, like Christendom, you know, the, the, the kingdom of, of, of those who are in Christ. He says the parable of the two olive trees illustrates great dispensational facts and contains solemn warnings for Christendom. The good olive tree typifies Israel in covenant relation with God in the Abrahamic covenant. So far, so good. The olive tree is evergreen. The, the olive is green, and so is the covenant unchangeable. So far, so good. Why is it an olive tree? Why is David a green olive tree? Because God's promises endure forever, right? And, it, and why is the, the candle burn with olive oil forever? Because God's covenant is forever. You see, so that's what's going on there. And so he says, Israel's faithfulness and disobedience cannot annul it. The root is Abraham. So if Israel's unfaithful, they're just cut off the tree. The tree doesn't die. They cut the branches off, and the tree keeps going. Okay, uh, they are now separated. Uh, what's it say? The root is Abraham, who was holy, separated to God on account of unbelief. Some of the branches were broken off. They are now separated from the good olive tree and are withered. Uh, he says the wild olive tree is, is a picture of the Gentiles. We'll get to that a little bit later. But the branches of this wild olive tree are grafted among the branches of the good olive tree to partake of the root and fatness of the good olive tree. The wild olive tree branches grafted upon the good olive tree do not represent the true church. I almost stood up and said, yeah, hooray. Uh, here's someone who, who's got it. And then he says, the Gentiles are meant by it, who are, after Israel's unbelief, put upon the ground of responsibility which Israel had to partake now of the promised covenant blessings. Exactly right. Okay, The people grafted in Romans 11 are Gentiles, who he's, in the words of Arnold Gabeline, which partake now of the promised covenant blessings of Israel. Okay. It's very clear to see that in Romans 11. Whomever's grafted in this tree gets what the people who were in the tree before got. The tree is Israel. The tree is the promises of Israel. Whomever's grafted in this thing partakes of Israel's and their, their promise and their dominion. Okay, uh, Which makes a, a really uh, a hard case to make at the church suddenly. You know, because uh, how, how, do you, how do you usurp that? Uh, but then he goes on to say the grafted in branches represent the Christian profession. Uh, I don't know how he makes the, how he makes the leap. But he says, the grafting them branches are solemnly warned. They are not to boast, not to be high-minded. They must abide in goodness. If the warning is unheeded, they will not be spared but cut off. He says, Christendom is exactly that which is here warned against. Boasting, high-minded, not abiding in goodness, apostate. The unbelief and failure of professing Christendom is as great, if not greater, than the unbelief and failure of Israel. The time will come when God will not spare, but execute judgment upon Christendom. He will spew Laodicea out of his mouth. And so... You see his conclusion. He makes the graft in branch the, the Christian kingdom, and he says, apparently you read that, the branch can be broken off. God's judging his Christian kingdom. Right? And he looks around and says, the church is a mess. We need to be careful. God's going to judge us and cut us off. Okay? 
Uh, to which I would say, cut us off from what exactly, Mr. Arno gave life? I mean, Israel's dominion? We're never promised that in the first place. But uh, meanwhile, that's his position. Uh, Brother Cornelius Stamm, who um, people will read his commentaries, we've got some of his literature in the back, um, makes, really goes different places in Romans 11. And uh, I wouldn't really encourage you to take uh, his commentary on Romans 11 as, as the, the Bible truth of it. But he says that the Grafton branch is a dispensational position. And so he says that the Grafton branch is the dispensational change between Israel and the dispensation of grace. And so when that branch is cut off, that's just the change back to Israel. And so he, he makes the cutting off a, a, a requirement for God's program to be fulfilled. And how there'll be time in the future where we're cut off, that cutting off is our rapture. Uh, which is, again, kind of a hard stretch. Paul's not really dealing with that in Romans 11. Uh, that's why he makes it, realizing that, hey, we can't make this about salvation, otherwise we lose our salvation. We can't make this about you and me and our position in Christ, or else we lose our position in Christ when we're cut off. And so he makes it about a dispensational position. And like I said, wrongly identifying the Grafton branches really does bring about some of these wrong doctrines. If you make yourself the Grafton branch today, you will lose your certain position in the body of Christ. You will lose some of the riches you have in Christ by grace. Okay, just the nature of it. A lot of people who make themselves the Grafton branch, knowingly, un knowingly or unknowingly, uh, will use these verses and find support for their idea that you can lose your salvation. That works somehow... Um, uh, affect your position in Christ. Okay? It's just wrong. And we know that because we study the rest of We study Romans 5 through 8. What we learn in Romans 8? We're more than conquerors. You know, we're not going to fail of the love of Christ because that's his love. He did it. Who shall condemn us? It's Christ that died for us. We didn't die for ourselves. So, I mean, you see, there, there's the issue. Um, and so Romans 11 is dealing with people who, are, who were not privy to mystery information. Okay, now they can read Romans now and understand it, but Paul's explaining what happened to Israel. Okay, he's not here preaching uh, to Israel their gospel and their kingdom. Okay, he's telling what happened. It's historical. But meanwhile, uh, so there's just a few positions that are out there. Um, John Gill, a, a famous uh, commentator in Romans 11, says that the breaking off of the branches... Uh, means that, uh, let me just see what he says here, that lest by imbibing principles derogatory from the grace of God or by an unbecoming walk and conversation, they provoke the Lord to unchurch them as he had done the Jews before them. So he makes the tree the church and how the Jews were the church before and now the church is the church today and if we're not careful, you know, God's going to break, he's going to, he says, unchurch us just like he unchurched the Jews. I don't know what that means, okay? I am a new creature of the body of Christ, and I'm a member of his body, 1 Corinthians 12, 13, flesh is flesh, bone is bones. How do I get unchurched because of my unbecoming walk and conversation? I have a conversation in heavenly places, Philippians 3, verse 20. I know that, okay? So what's that to do with me being unchurched? Uh, meanwhile, he says the gospel church state, again, that's something foreign to the scripture, the gospel church state into which the Gentiles were taken in which, with respect to particular persons, may intend the act of excommunication by the church. And so he's talking about those broken off branches meaning justification for excommunication, taking someone out of the church, being unchurched, right? Just baloney, okay? And, and people get the just, get justifications for some of these wrong things from Romans 11, and they're misidentifying the graft and branch. So be very careful here in, in asking the right questions about where, what the context is. Like we've been studying on Sunday, we have to determine... Who is speaking? To whom? What about? At what time are they talking about? Do you fit in the context here? All right. The, the context, of course, the last three chapters, Paul has been talking about true Israel. Right? We, we've hit that theme for three months. He's been talking about who is Israel? What about their promises? And he says in Romans 9, not all Israel is Israel. And so the conclusion of that discussion should be what? Identifying who true Israel is. Right? And Romans 11 talks about their restoration and God's fulfillment of his promises. And so Israel restored. Romans 11, 26, we'll get to next week. <clears throat> the end of the discussion here is Israel shall be saved. As it is written, they shall come out of Zion the deliverer and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. This is my coming unto them. So he begins the three chapters, Romans 9, saying what happened to Israel? Not all of Israel is Israel. And at the end he says God's going to fulfill his promise. You think it, that God's word is not effect, Romans 9. And Paul says, no, it is effect. It's going to happen. Okay, just something something happened so that's not happening now, right? And that's what he's explaining. And so we can, at a very high level, very spiritualized teaching, 
uh, say that uh, we can learn a dispensational truth from these chapters to say that there was once Israel, now there's the church, there will be Israel again. And that's really too elementary to fit into these three chapters. As we've been seeing how Paul's not dealing just with that, that threefold division. He's talking about Old Testament Israel, then the remnant of Israel. Okay, he's not even talking about the church. And then he's talking about the restoration of Israel. Okay, and so you really have to understand what, what, uh, who he's talking about here. Um, and following the prophecies really help you with that. Uh, there are more players here than what most people consider. I mentioned uh, Mu and some of the other commentators. They just say there's Gentile Christians and there's Hebrew Christians. Right? Well, that, that's not, not the only people out there. You have, if I can do it up here, you have a Jew, you have a Jew, and you have a Jew. And you have three different kinds of Gentiles as well. You have Jew and Gentile who become one in the body of Christ, right? In which really there is no Jew or Gentile. So when you become part of the body of Christ, according to the mystery, you're no longer a Jew. You're no longer a Gentile. You're a member of the body of Christ, member of one of another. So you can be a Jew here or a Jew here, according to Paul's preaching of the mystery. Then you've got over here, unbelieving Jews and Gentiles. He said the Jews who reject uh, the gospel, reject uh, the commandments, don't do the good works. And you have the Gentiles, of course, they've been given up a long time ago. And then you've got those Jews who are faithful according to prophecy. The kingdom. So you see, you really have a, an issue here where you need to discern because at one point, people thought in time past there's just Jew and Gentile. That's all there are. Well, actually, there was faithful Jews, unfaithful Jews. There were faithful Gentiles, unfaithful Gentiles. Right? When you say Gentile in Romans 11 13, I speak to you Gentiles, which one is he speaking to? You see, you had a question that needs to be asked. You can't just say, oh, he's speaking about Gentile Christians. What do you mean? Gentiles about Christ? Because then we've got problems with you being cut off of the body of Christ. The only Gentile in this picture who is faithful and can get cut off is this guy right here. Okay? He's in Israel's kingdom. He's saying, I'm going there, but he's not there yet. Okay? You're already in Christ. You're crucified with him. You don't belong in that position. But this guy does. This guy sure can. He has no faith anyway. He's part of unbelieving Gentile, Gentile nations. But here's the Gentile who's part of Israel's program. He's going to go into that earthly kingdom. Has that earthly hope. So you see, you have to understand there's more players here. We've got six different people than what most people realize. Okay, you can't just say, are you a Jew? You can't just say, are you a Gentile? You're going to say, well, at what time were you a Jew or Gentile? What, what, what are you, which one are you? And that's what Paul's dealing with here. He's dealing with a mixed bag over there in Rome. And uh, what we know for sure, if we look, read Romans 11, 17 through 24, is that the graft in branch partakes of God's purpose for Israel. God's purpose for Israel according to prophecy. The Grafton branch takes part in this. Okay. This is the tree, gospel fulfilling according to prophecy. The Grafton branch takes part of this. Okay. Why would you take the mystery body of Christ and put it back into the prophetic fulfillment of Israel? Which makes no sense whatsoever. And people don't see that. Okay. They, they don't see that there's a problem with that. Uh, but meanwhile, the Grafton, whatever it is, partakes of God's purpose for Israel, which, in, which can include the kingdom of Gentiles. Right? It could. Uh, I mean, and that's what Romans 11 talks about. Uh, look at Romans 11, verse uh, 17. We learn that from Romans 11, 17, where it says that if, the, if you are grafted amongst them, you with them partakest of the root and fatness of the olive tree. Well, the root and fatness of the olive tree is Israel's promises, their kingdom, their dominion. Right? So the grafted branch takes part in Israel's kingdom and dominion, their promises that God gave to them. Verse 18, then, the admonition against those grafted branches is to boast not against the, the fallen branches. But if thou boast, this is what you need to hear. Thou bearest not the root, but the root thee. That's the admission of those who boast. So you got these Gentiles here that are boasting against these people, unbelieving Jews who help you get it. And Paul says, look, if you're going to boast, you need to remember. Okay, the only reason why you're getting any of this prophetic kingdom business is because the promise is God given to Israel. The root that bears you. Okay, you didn't bear the root. You didn't do something special where God said, oh, you know what, Gentiles are better than Jews. No. That didn't work. He made the promises to Israel. Okay? And so, if you partake of those promises, partake of the kingdom dominion given to Israel, then you need to not boast. Okay? You just got the mercy from the Lord is what you got. And so, in, in verse um, 19, move on. Thou wilt say then, the branches were broken off, that I might be grafted in. By the way, who are the broken off branches? Let me, these guys here. Unbelieving Israel. Broken branches. Right. These guys who were separated from the Gentiles as being God's chosen people, and yet they were broken off because of their unbelief. 
Right. That's the broken branches right there. And so he says, uh, if that will say the branches were broken off and you grafted in as if these guys take the place of these guys and suddenly they can never, they won't get saved ever. Okay, God's forgotten about Israel entirely. It's all, it's a Gentile kingdom now. God's replaced Israel with the Gentiles. And it's going to be a Gentile kingdom on the earth. We're going to reign over everything. Well, actually, God's promise was that Israel would reign over the nations, you see. So he says uh, in Romans eleven nineteen. remember back up in Romans 11, verse uh, 11, where Paul says, have they stumbled that they should fall? God forbid, rather through their fall, salvation has come to the Gentiles. Most people stop right there. That's not what he's saying. Salvation has come to the Gentiles for to provoke them to jealousy. The only reason why these Gentiles right here got any mercy from God is to provoke these guys to get into the program. Right? That's why God showed them mercy. Is hoping to get these guys saved. Paul's saying God didn't give you salvation because he rejected his people. He brought salvation to you so that these people would get saved. It was an attempt to do that. Okay. And so these people are saying that they were broken off, that I could replace them. Paul goes, eh, because of unbelief they were broken off. It's true that that's what happened, but it's because of unbelief they were broken off, and thou stands by faith, not by your works, not because you come from a better line than they did. In fact, those Gentiles had nothing to claim against those Jews. They weren't God's promised people. They weren't given the promises originally. Okay, they, they didn't have the covenants. Remember Ephesians 2, verse 12? You are called uncircumcision, strangers of the covenants. They didn't have anything, right? So what were they to say, I was grabbed in instead of them because of my virtue? Well, they weren't. Paul says because of unbelief. That's the reason why they were cut off, unbelief. And you stand by faith. So he says, be not high-minded, but fear. No, by the way, Let's go through these verses here. Notice that Paul's saying thou all the way through this. Of course, that means singular. And I don't want to deal with the whole singular plural at this moment just because you're not going to be able to identify the single person he's dealing with. But uh, the, he's not saying us. He's not saying, and we stand by faith. He's not saying the body of Christ stands by faith. He's saying, you stand by faith. And then he says, they are doing this, but you do this. You see what he, he's talking to two people in the room. It, it's not the church of the body of Christ. Okay. And meanwhile, he says, be not high-minded, but fear. Why ought they to fear? We, God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of love and a sound mind. Right? He's not given us the spirit of fear, but of adoption. Whereby we cry, Abba, Father, Romans chapter 8, verse 15. Why would Paul tell you, be, be not high-minded, but fear? Right? He wouldn't. But these people are in a tree. And the branches of the tree can be broken off. These people have been given the hope of the promises given to Israel, which is the kingdom. And Jesus taught in Mark 13, 13, you have to endure to the end of his saying. Right? He said, you'll know them by their fruits. And if they don't bear the fruit and they're sitting in that tree, there's a problem. They are grafted in by faith, but faith without works is dead, James 2, right? So if they're grafted in there and they don't show the works, meet for repentance, then you know, they're, they're off. They can be cut off. You don't have that problem. Okay? You're not in that positional standing. And so these people are in Israel's tree. By the way, I put it on the top of your outline, and I say it here again. You always need to remember this is Israel's tree. Right? Because it, it'll help you to, to, to stay away from putting yourself in there. It's Israel's tree. It's their promises, their dominion. It's Israel's tree. The promises gave to Israel about it down here. You don't belong there. Okay? But meanwhile... Um, they need to fear because they're in the position of Israel's tree, and that position is uh, it's unstable. Right? It, that position is something that they can lose. It's conditional. You don't have that spirit. Romans 11, verse 21. If God spared not the natural branches, who are the natural branches? We saw the guy in Mark 10 who did all the commandments. <laughs> that guy seemed like a righteous guy, right? And yet he did not do the thing that Jesus said to do, the last thing, the one thing that he lacked. He didn't do, right? So they, they did the ties, the anise and cumin and everything else, but they forgot the way your matters of the law, Matthew 23, 23, right? The natural branches were broken off. It says, if he spared not the natural branches, take heed lest he also spare not thee. You know, they had covenants. They had sure mercies of David. They had promises. They had circumcision. They had sacrifices. Gentiles, what they got? Nothing, right? And so these guys didn't have any reason for God to do anything for them, okay? So if God didn't spare the natural branches and cut them off, and they're not going to get the kingdom. Those people that were cut off, the individuals, they're not going in the kingdom. Right? So he says to these people, here, these individuals, be careful because God won't spare you either. And so, by the way, this is not you. Spared from what exactly? What are they going to be spared from? 
cutting off. That's not, it is a metaphor. What's the metaphor for? Burning up and judgment, right? Remember that we covered all in all prophecies back there? And that cutting off of the branches and they're being burnt up was the Lord actually coming back in judgment and burning these people up, right? This isn't just a slap on the wrist. This isn't just a dispensational change as Sam would have it be. Okay, this is, you're cut off. You're cut off from God's covenant. You're cut off from the promises. You're cut, there's no way in. You're cut off, okay? And so uh, you're not subject to that. Okay, 1 Thessalonians 1 verse 10 says you're delivered from the wrath to come. 1 Thessalonians 5 19 says you're appointed unto salvation, not unto wrath. So you're not there in a position where you have to worry about God sparing you or not. God, please spare me. Now you worry where you got saved, but now you're saved in the body of Christ. You're complete in him. Ephesians 1 verse 13, you heard the gospel, you trusted it, you're sealed with the Spirit. Sparing you from what? Romans 5, verse 1, don't we know we're justified by faith, therefore we're at peace with God? If you're at peace with God, then why are you fearing God not sparing you? You see the contradiction here. Paul is not talking about the, same, the people in the same position in Romans 5, verse 1. Right? These people are fearing for their position in this tree. Uh, but meanwhile, in Romans 11, verse 22, Behold, therefore, the goodness and severity of God. Now, the goodness and severity of God here is going to be the goodness on the branches put in and the severity on those cut off, right? But remember, we've already dealt with this doctrine. Paul's just wrapping this up. Back in Romans chapter 9, verse 15, this is exactly what Paul was dealing with back here. Remember Romans 9, 15? Is there unrighteousness with God? God forbid. For he said to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. It's, it's God's will, Right? Who he wants to have a soft hand to and show mercy, that's his prerogative. Who he wants to have a hard hand to and show severity, that's his prerogative, right? And God, Romans 9, the whole, the whole chapter of Romans 9 is defining what his prerogative was. It was the children of promise, not the children of the flesh. It was that by faith, not by their works, Romans chapter 10, right? And so Romans 11, he says, Behold, therefore, the goodness and severity of God on them which fell, severity. So they're cut off. Why are they cut off? It's a lack of faith. But the guy did the commandments in Mark 10. Did you hear it? He did the commandments. Jesus loved him for doing that. But he didn't sell everything he had. Right? Why didn't, why didn't God make an exception? This guy did all the commandments, but he just didn't. He didn't. That, that's God's will. It's his prerogative. Okay? So to, severity towards them, but goodness to who? To these Gentiles who were never going to come into promises. They didn't keep all the commandments that guy did. And yet what? They received the Messiah. They put their faith in him. Okay, and so they get goodness. By the way, what, what do you call it when someone isn't? Is, well, we'll get to this a little bit later. Meanwhile, the goodness and severity of God is, is that doctrine back in Romans nine verse fifteen: the mercy and the hardness of God. Is this not God before the world began, uh, determining who's going to save and who's not going to save? This is God looking at people, looking at the, the per, His purpose being fulfilled, and whether people are going to get in that or not. And He shows mercy to whom He will, and shows hardness to whom He will. God's not obligated to give you a third, fourth, fifth chance. He's not obligated to give you a second chance. Okay? God tells you the truth, and you're the ant that's got to respond positively. Okay? But Romans 11, verse 22, he says, Toward thee, goodness, if thou... Now notice this last part of the verse, which really is the linchpin uh, to the coffin of, of the church being the grafted branch here. If thou continue in his goodness, otherwise thou also shalt be cut off. There is no sense in which this can be you, the church of the body of Christ. Cut off from what exactly? The only way Brother Stan gets around is he makes the tree dispensational position. So when you're cut off, the dispensations change. You know, I don't see that anywhere in the past. He had to make that up because he realizes, it, and he says three times in his commentary, Peter Ruckman says the same thing in his commentary, and others say as well, they realize if we make this salvation, it's contrary to what Paul says elsewhere. So it can't be salvation, it's going to be something else. Right? Well, I'm not saying it's salvation, I'm saying it's God's promise to Israel. Which, by the way, was salvation to them. When did Israel get saved? In the kingdom. When did salvation come to Israel, the nation, from their enemies? In the kingdom. Right? When did they get salvation? At the revelation of Jesus Christ, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 15. Right? At the end, endure to the end, to be saved. And so, you know, salvation came differently to them than it does to us. But people are exactly right. If you make this is contrary to what Paul says us, other, elsewhere in his epistles, okay, these people shall be cut off if they don't continue in God's goodness. So if they get on God's bad side, if they get into God's hardness, 
He'll cut them off. And they also, if they abide not still in unbelief, shall be grafted again. They who? They the cut off branches. Okay, those who were in unbelief, if they abide not still in unbelief, shall be grafted in. <laughs> it wasn't enough to say that this, this graft and branch can be cut off. Notice who gets grafted in with them again? Israel. Why do they get grafted in? It was their tree to begin with. Right? Can you say any of the doctrines about the church body of Christ going to heavenly places complete in Christ was, was Israel's at all? They never had that. They never had the mystery kept secrets of the world began. That's very different. They had an earthly promise, have dominion on the earth, covenant promises and everything else. They had circumcision and all that. Right? They had the promises to Abraham. You were never given the promises to Abraham. Okay? And so it says they, if they don't abide in unbelief, and so they believe, they'll be grafted into their tree again. And here's this grafted-in branch sitting next to the guy who was cut off, and he's grafted in again, going, I'm the church. Who are you? I'm Israel. And they, both in the same tree. And either one of them can be cut off. Okay, This doesn't work with how God's operating today. We'll get to it here in a bit. But look at Hebrews chapter 6, verse 4. There are places in your Bible that you find these people who, um, in which they're abiding in God's purpose is conditional. You know, people will fight the day as long by eternal security. Uh, you've got folks up in Chicago who say that everyone in the Bible is eternally secure. You've got uh, Arminians and the, and the Holiness people who say nobody in the Bible is eternally secure. And uh, they're both right, they're both wrong. Okay, you can find verses in the Bible that, that say you are, verses in the Bible that say you are not. Uh, they, they conveniently are wrapped around the, the same area. You know, Paul teaches security of the believer because you're crucified, you're dead, Christ did it all, and you're in this new creature body of Christ. But then you can find in Israel's program all over that they do not have salvation yet. And so until they get it, their position is, is unstable. Okay? It's not that they possess it, then they drop it. It's not that they were saved and suddenly jumped back into the water. It's that salvation hasn't come quite yet. So we have said it before, all through Israel's program, salvation comes to Israel either when they die or when the kingdom comes, whichever's first. You are already dead while you live. That's the dissipation of grace principle. And so thank the Lord that you're crucified with him, that you can live now and be certain of your eternal salvation because you're trusting what Christ did on the cross for you. Amen. Okay? And so Hebrews chapter 6, you've got people here in Hebrews who are operating under the New Testament, which is a promise of that coming kingdom, the fulfillment of Israel's prophecy, and until that kingdom come, all they got is that mortgage. They got this promise that's going to happen, and they're on the right road, straight and narrow. But until that kingdom come, they can fall off the road. Or they can divert from the path. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 4 says, It is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost. Who's he talking about? Well, it's going to be somebody past Pentecost. Pentecost when the Holy Ghost came down, right? So people at Pentecost... Israel, the remnant of Israel there, it's impossible for them and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come. That's the kingdom. If you experience these kingdom powers, right, that the Holy Ghost gave them, if they shall fall away to renew them again unto repentance, seeing they crucified themselves, the Son of God afresh, and put him to an open shame. It's impossible, it says. So they were given the Holy Ghost, Ezekiel 36 says, to supernaturally empower them, to cause them to walk in God's statutes whereby they had to intentionally resist that Holy Ghost in order to deny the powers that they, they had. Okay? And if they do that, it says it's impossible. Why is it impossible? Because there's no more sacrifice for sins. Okay, look at Hebrews chapter 10. A different position than what you have, by the way, where you have the offering of uh, payment for all your sins if you just agree to die with Christ on the cross. If you trust what he did and that, that it was a substitute for you, you're dead. That's it. Okay, so all your sins are paid for. There you go. Uh, these people weren't given that as an option. They were given New Testament, given to that. And it's the Holy Ghost that's going to uh, cause you to get there. Okay? Hebrews 10, verse 26. If we sin willfully, after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remains no more sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fire and indignation, which shall devour the adversaries. That's a cut off branch. These are people who are in the tree and experiencing the Holy Ghost. And he's going, if you sin willfully, be careful. God won't spare you. Okay, He'll cut you off, and a certain fearful looking for of judgment, fire, and indignation will devour you. Just like the adversaries. Okay? 
He goes on to explain how, because, uh, you know, under Moses' law, they were condemned. How much more under this new law, the New Testament, will you be condemned? Okay, so at the, at the end of Hebrews 10, he, he goes on in four or five verses at the end there, encouraging them to endure and keep going and, and uh, you know, don't fall back. Okay? Uh, you have a complete position. Ever since the moment you trust in the gospel, you're complete. There's nothing you're waiting on, there's nothing you're enduring through for salvation. You have it all in Christ. That's the riches of God's grace, by the way. When it says in Romans chapter 11, that if they also, if they abide not still in unbelief, they shall be grafted in. When it talks about if you continue in his goodness, otherwise thou shalt be cut off. And we saw Hebrews 10 about the, uh, the sin, sinning willfully and all that business. This is the same doctrine Jesus taught in John 15. Look at John 15. It's all over Jesus' ministry where he talks about these trees and whether they're going to be broken off or not because prophecy taught that when the tree budded, when the tree blossomed, when the tree expanded, that was the kingdom come. And all throughout prophecy, God's constantly cutting down and pruning this tree because you know, the Israel at that time wasn't, wasn't worthy of getting it. But in John 15, you've got this popular passage where Jesus says, I am the, the vine. You are the branches, right? John 51, I am the true vine. My father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that bears not fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he purges it, that it may bring forth more fruit, right? Purges. So even the ones that had fruit, what's he do? Put them through a little tribulation so that they would be pure and bear more fruit, right? Cutting off all those, those bad parts of the good branches, right? Uh, who's he talking to, by the way, in John 15? The 12 apostles. The remnant of Israel. Does the church exist in John 15? No. The mystery that wasn't revealed until Paul, the church isn't even here. He's talking about branches being graft, uh, branches bearing fruit and branches being cut off. Verse 3 says, Now you are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine. Jeremiah 23 talks about the righteous branch. Right? That's Jesus. He's the righteous branch of the tree through which it will be fulfilled. And uh, you know the, the branches will, will grow out of. So they're going to abide in him. Okay, If they don't, they're cut off. In verse 5, I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abides in me and I in him, the same brings forth much fruit. By the way, this is one of those cases where you see the doctrine of Israel being told that they need to be in Christ. Right? People will sometimes, based on Romans 16, so you know, well, well, Paul says there are people in Christ before him. So, obviously, they both thought the same thing. No. Jesus taught, it's always been taught, that you have to be in the Lord. Okay? When the Messiah comes, you have to be in him. Okay? We're in Christ. But how did you get into Christ? Is it because you're abiding according to this tree program, or you're, abiding, or you're in him because you're a part of his body, you're an arm? There's a difference in the relationship. But he says here, if a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered, and men gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. That's what John the Baptist taught. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will, it shall be done unto you. There you go. There's a good Christian teaching today, right? So you're the graft in tree, what's that mean? I get to partake of Israel's promises, the promises that God will give me whatever I ask. You know? Uh, well, no. It's not going to work for you today. It's not a practical level, but it's not even given to you doctrinally. He's talking to Israel about their covenants. He says uh, in verse 8, Here is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit, which is a, a whole sermon in itself. How does God get glory through Israel's tree? By the fruit that comes off of it, right? How does God get glory through the body of Christ? Because he died for you, right? It's not because of the fruit you bear, okay? That, that's secondary. That's your daily Christian life. He gets glory from you because look at those sinners. I died for them and made them glorious, right? These people... They're a tree that bears fruit, and the fruit's what gives God glory. Of course, they can't bear the fruit on their own, so he gives them the Holy Spirit to cause them to do it, which is God doing it for them. Right? So you see, either, there's two ways that he gets glory in his, in his will. That's another sermon for another time. Verse 9, As the Father hath loved me, so have I loved you. Continue ye in my love. If ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. So he's been saying the whole time, abide in me. And the question you should be asking is, how do I do that? And in John 15, verse 10, he says, If you keep my commandments, you shall abide in my love. Right? What happens if you don't? You're off. Right? That's why he loved the guy who kept the commandments in Mark 10. Right? The guy said, I kept the commandments. He goes, I love this guy. And then he says, Follow me. He goes, I don't want to abide in you. I don't do it on my own. Ah, what? Cut off that branch. You have to abide in me and do the commandments. Right? That's the way to bear the fruit. And so um, it's, it's not just. Uh, 
the faith, of course, in this program, there's a performance there that needs to happen. It's the same thing you see in 1 John. By the way, you see a pattern here, don't we? We have uh, the Gospel of John dealing with performance, which is contrary to how some people will teach it. You have 1 John, the same guy, talking about performance. Uh, some people, uh, Brother Terry, it is commentary back there, will say John wrote Hebrews as well, which seems to be kind of likely because it speaks about performance as well in, in Israel and their, in their position. But 1 John chapter 4, verse 12, look what John writes to the remnant of Israel. He says, No man hath seen God at any time. If we love one another, God dwells in us. And of course, we dwell in him. Will be the implication, right? And his love is perfected in us. If what? If we love one another. That love, the performance. Hereby know we that we dwell in him and he in us, because he hath given us of his spirit. So how do they know if they're a part of the tree or not? Well, they got the spirit. Right? And how do they know if, if they, they dwell in him? Because they love one another. Verse 14, we have seen and testified the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. Whosoever shall confess that Jesus is the Son of God, God dwells in him and he in God. That's Romans 10. Confess with your mouth. Right? Jesus is Lord. And we have known and believed the love that God hath to us. God is love and so on and so forth. The, look down in verse, um, uh, first, first John 5, verse one, whosoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and everyone that loves him that begat loveth him also that is begotten of him. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments. And his commandments are not grievous. Right? Romans 5.8 says God commanded his love that while we are still sinners, Christ died for us. That's the message of grace and reconciliation. The message of performance under the Testament is that you know God loves you and you love God because you love other people and he loved you and love, love, commandments. Right. Um, th this is about that tree. This is how they knew they were branches. This is why Paul's warning them, hey, you're grafting in that tree. Be careful. You'll be broken off unless you love your brother. Right? Don't be boasting like that. that. That's how people got cut off before. Right? And that's exactly what he's saying in Romans 11 to the, to the people who uh, were, were grafted into Israel's tree. When it says that shall be cut off, in no sense can this be the church. Colossians, look at Colossians 2, 9 and 10. You know Colossians 2.10, you're complete in him. And we kind of quote that verse as a bookmark and a stamp to say that, look, we don't need anything else. We're complete. It's finished. And yet, look at the context Paul's, Paul says that. Colossians 2, verse 8. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world. Rudiments of the world. Okay. What's that? Well, that's fleshly desires, right? Is it? Or is it like trees and kingdoms and dominions that you have nothing to do with? And they're trying to attract you to say, hey, look, if you want to get that kingdom, you need to do this and do that and do the other thing. Right? He's saying, don't be, don't be tricked by the rudiments of the world, not after Christ. For in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. What is the tree? Israel's promises. Right? Getting into that tree is different than getting into Christ. When you make that tree Christ, all of a sudden you're John Gill, who makes you being the unchurched when you get cut off. Right? That tree is Israel's dominion, is their promises. Now, getting into Christ is something else. Okay? And so you're in the body of Christ. For, in verse 9, For in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. In Christ dwells the fullness of the Godhead. If you're in him, you don't need anything else. Okay? And so th there's, there's more to being in him according to the mystery than what John 15 said according to prophecy. You're complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power, in whom you're circumcised, in verse 12, you're buried with him in baptism. So you're baptized spiritually there. In verse 13, you're quickened together with him. Verse 14, the, the law, the ordinances against you are blotted out of the way. Well, if they're blotted in verse 14, the handwriting of ordinances that was against us was contrary to us, took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. Then on what basis do we need to fear lest we not be spared? What's the standard for that? Right? Boasting? I thought that was part of the handwriting of ordinances that were against us. You see, the, the difference, the position Paul's teaching here. And so down in verse 16, let no man therefore judge you and meet and drink in respect of a holy day and so on and so forth. Verse 18, let no man beguile you of your reward and a voluntary humility and a worshiping of angels, intruding of those things they have not seen. So you need to hold the head up and stand fast in the liberty where Christ has made you free in the body of Christ. That's very different than Romans 11 where these guys are, are branches in a tree that Jesus talked about in John 15. Okay. 2 Timothy 2, 13. If you uh, deny him, he's faithful, it says. 2 Timothy 2, 13. You know the passage? Paul says, if we believe not, yet he abides faithful, he cannot deny himself. 
right? Christ can't, you're, you're a member of his body. You deny him, uh, he'll deny you. I mean, you won't get the rewards for that, right? But he can't deny himself. You are a part of his body. If this tree is Christ, you know what he's doing? He's cutting off parts of himself all the time he cuts off these people. It's not Christ. It's the promise. He can cut off people from his promise and the tree still stands. The promise is still there. Okay. But he, he's not cutting off himself, the members of his body. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 30, says that you are flesh of his flesh, bone of his bones. We are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his mother and father, and shall be joined into his wife. The two shall be one flesh. Uh, this is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. So the picture of Christ and the church is the marriage relationship. If you make this the picture of you and Christ, then you're preaching divorce. Okay? Do something wrong, God's cutting you off. Right? Oh, whoops. But these, Ephesians 5, 30 through 30, 31 here says, The two become one. What God joins together, no man tear asunder, as you say in the wedding ceremony, right? Coming from, coming from Matthew. That's the mystery of the church in Christ. Nothing separates it. Romans 8. What shall separate from the love of Christ? Romans chapter 8 says, Nothing. Life nor death, nothing. Right? Apparently in Romans 11, their boasting can get them cut off. <laughs> get very different th than your position. And so going back to Romans 11. I'm hoping to, to draw that contrast. So we talk about this grafted into Israel's tree to show that it cannot be you. Which, uh, if it's not the body of Christ, you know that leaves only two groups of people that are faithful. Either faithful Jew, faithful Gentile. Make it whomever you want. Right? I think it's probably both of them. Okay? That, that stay in that tree. But meanwhile, um, Romans 11, verse 23. It says, They also, the they, of course, is Israel, if they abide not still in unbelief, so if they abide, if they, if they change to be believers, shall be grafted in to their own tree, for God is able to graft them in again. He is able, and by the way, it says that he will down in Romans eleven twenty six. It says that they shall be saved according to the covenant. Time will not end, the sun and moon will not fall until God has kept his promise with Israel, Jeremiah says. James 1 says that. He's the father of lights in which there is no shadow of turning. As you see the sun and the moon, God will keep his promise to Israel. Well, he will. Okay, so that, that, that's the promise according to the Bible. And so in Romans eleven twenty three, he's pointing out to these Gentiles that are boasting, saying he can graft them in again. Not only can he, but he will. Right? So stop boasting. Right? And by the way, when these Gentiles who are in Israel's kingdom, and they're, they're pretty happy because they get what these guys don't, and Israel comes to their fullness, who's over these guys? Israel. Right? You stop boasting. Right? Well, you think you got so great now, Israel's going to get over you in the kingdom. Okay, so, meanwhile, uh, Romans eleven twenty four, For if thou were cut out of the olive tree which is wild by nature, were graft contrary to nature into a good olive tree, how much more shall these, the broken off branches, Israel, unbelieving Israel, which be the natural branches, be grafted into their own olive tree? So again, it's their tree, Israel's tree. They were cut off, he's saying, they can be put back in. Okay, so just because they were broken off, just because you've got some broken branches, it's not God predetermining now to cast Israel into to hellfire. I mean, no, they, they, they can return, you see. And so it has to do with their abiding and belief or not. And so um, these people are Israel, it's not you. We need to deal with something here about the good and the wild trees, because this is the second time Paul's mentioned it. If thou were cut out of the olive tree which is wild by nature, or graft contrary to nature to a good olive tree, so if a good goes into a good one, that's, that's natural, right? But it's a wild tree, a wild olive tree, and a good olive tree. Those are different, different trees, the same type. They're olives, but one's good, one's wild. What makes it good? What makes it wild? Look at Matthew 7. If you recall, last week we gave you a, a clue to that. We went back to Isaiah chapter 6 and uh, the prophecy about the vineyard of Israel. Remember that? God planted the vineyard. He hedged it round about. He wanted to have grapes, and instead he got wild grapes. Right? And what was the wild grape? It was the bad behavior. It was the disobedience, the faithlessness. Matthew 7, Jesus says the same thing here about being able to identify the good in the olive tree and the good in the wild tree, which is what we're trying to do in Romans 11. Who are these trees? Right? Matthew 7, verse 15, Jesus tells you how to identify them. Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening, uh, ravening wolves. And so he's warning the believing group around him to beware of those who look religious, who say they're religious, who say they're prophets in Israel, but they're false. 
their wolves in sheep's clothing, as he says. Uh, beware of their clothes, is what he's saying. Read James 2 again, it, with that in mind. James writing to the remnant, and James says, if people come to you with the gay clothing, and you give them the high seats and all that, but these people don't even believe that Jesus is the Messiah. They're sheep, uh, wolves of sheep clothing. You know, in verse 16, you shall know them, false prophets, the wolves of sheep's clothing, by their fruits. Okay? What, what determines if they're in the tree or not? The fruit, right? You'll know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? No. Can you get the fruit from dead branches who have none? No. That's what he's saying. Can you get a grape from an olive tree or, or an olive from a grape tree? Nope. We saw that in James 3 last time. But look what he says here. He goes on to explain a good tree. Remember in Romans 11, a good, good olive tree? A wild olive tree. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit. Neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Remember, Jesus said, unless you abide in me, you won't bear any fruit. So the wild olive tree that was put into the good olive tree, they weren't bearing fruit over there in the wild tree. They had to abide in Christ for that. But why were they grafted in? Because they had faith, right? They were put in by faith, and that's how they can bear fruit. But if they don't bear that fruit, they're cut off. Matthew 7, verse uh, 18. So a corrupt tree can't bring forth good fruit, and a good tree won't bring forth corrupt fruit. And so if a, uh, there's dead branches in a good tree, they should be cut off. Right? Verse 19, every tree that brings not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. We've heard that three times already in Jesus' ministry. And it says, Wherefore by their fruits ye shall know them. Right? That's how you can identify who that branch is, by their fruits. At any level, do you identify who's in Christ or not today, according to the mystery, by their fruits? No, you can't. You don't belong in that tree, folks. You're identifying these branches by their fruits. You can't identify members of the body by their fruits. Okay, you identify members of the body by their faith in the gospel. You don't know someone's sealed with the Holy Spirit. You don't see the Holy Spirit, but they're sealed by faith, by trusting the gospel, not by their works. Okay? You can't be that tree. And we're just showing you verse after verse to show you why it can't be. Look at Matthew 21. We'll cover a couple other parables here that Jesus teaches. All through his ministry, he's doing this. He's identifying the remnant. He's identifying the branches that bear fruit. And conversely, identifying the broken off branches, the branches that will be broken off. It's a good question to ask is when are these branches broken off? When does this identification happen? We're seeing it happening in the red letters, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, before the mystery is even revealed. Okay? Matthew 21. In Matthew 21, verse 28. Now, we're going to read this parable in the context of what we've been learning about the trees and the fruits and the, and the olive and everything else. And the, the, uh, the nature of the people in Israel, there's not all Israel that is Israel. Some of them are unfaithful. In Matthew 21, 28. Jesus says, What think you? A certain man had two sons. He came to the first and said, Son, go work today in my vineyard. And the answer said, I will not. <laughs> Rebellious son. <laughs> but afterward, he repented. Changed his mind. And he went. So at first he was rebellious, later he went and was obedient. He came to the second son and said likewise, and he answered and said, I will go, I go, sir. But later he did it. Whether of them twain did the will of his father? They said unto him, well, obviously the first one. Even though he initially rebelled, he repented and did what he said. The second one didn't even get to finish the job. Okay. Uh, and so Jesus said to them, Verily I say unto you that the publicans and the harlots go into the kingdom of God before you. For John came unto you in the way of righteousness, and ye believed him not, but the publicans and the harlots believed him. And ye, when ye had seen it, repented not afterward that ye might believe him. Can you, do you have ears to hear now? Can you understand what he's saying? He's saying, look, I'm coming to Israel. Who's the rebellious son? The people who went to John the Baptist. And they, they've got sins, and they're going, we're sorry for the sins. And he water baptized, and they believe. The Pharisees and Sadducees, they didn't bring forth fruit to be for They didn't get water baptized. They didn't follow the Messiah. But they're the ones who initially said, we're going to keep the commandments. We're in the temple. We're offering sacrifices. But they never finished the job. They didn't do it. They didn't follow the Messiah. Which one of them did the right thing? Obviously, those wild folks who were sinners who got water baptized. Not the people in the temple who were offering sacrifices and never followed the Lord. You see, that's exactly what he's saying in his parable here. Okay, look at verse 33. Here another parable. They're planted a vineyard and hedged it round about. You see the vineyard all throughout this here? It's about Israel. Uh, there was a certain householder which planted a vineyard and hedged it round about and digged a wine press in it, built a tower, it sounds like Isaiah 6, and, it, and let it out to husbandmen and went into a far country. When the time of the fruit drew near, he sent his servants to the husbandmen, they might receive the fruits of it. 
And the husbandman took his servants and beat one and killed another and stoned another. He sent other servants more than the first, and they did unto him likewise. But last of all, he sent unto them his son, saying, They will reverence my son. But when the husbandmen saw the son, they said among themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him, and let us seize on his inheritance. And they caught him and cast him out of the vineyard and slew him. When the Lord therefore the vineyard cometh, what will he do unto those husbandmen? And the Pharisees responded to him and said, He will miserably destroy those wicked men. What wicked men? They're speaking about themselves. You see the parable here. Jesus is talking about them. You guys are the wicked husbandmen who I've sent prophet to and prophet to, and you've killed each one of them. And here I come, you're going to kill me too. I'm taking the kingdom away from you guys. I'm cutting you off the tree, is what he's saying. Who gets the tree? Who gets grafted into the tree? Who remains in the tree? The people who follow the Messiah. We see the tree happening here. It doesn't happen later when Paul gets the mystery. It's happening right here, Matthew 21. He says in verse 40, uh, 40, 42, well, in verse 41 there, they said he'll destroy the wicked men and will let all his vineyard unto other husbandmen. So, obviously, these guys aren't good managers. He's going to get some new ones, right? And they give the answer to why God grafts in new, new branches. Okay, he's got new management here. And he says, uh, uh, in verse 42, Jesus said to them, Did ye never read the scriptures? The stone which the builders rejected, the same has become the head of the corner. That's what Paul quotes in Romans 9, 33, right? They stumbled over the stumbling stone. And the same is begun the head of the corner. This is the Lord's doing. It's marvelous in our eyes. Therefore say unto you, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation, bringing forth the fruits thereof. Right? He says, you're cut off, guys. I'm giving it to a nation bearing the fruits thereof. Who is that nation? We saw it in Romans 9 and 10. We see it in Luke 12, 32, where Jesus preaches to the, the, the faithful. And he says, it's God's good pleasure, little flock, to give you the kingdom. Okay, that's a singular nation. That's not the nation's plural. That's a nation. God gives the kingdom to the branches that stay in. The branches that he grafts in. They get it by faith. They're the ones that get it. Okay? The, the, the ones from the wild tree. That these Pharisees say, those guys aren't worthy. Right? You are a blind beggar. We're not going to listen to you. Remember when Jesus healed the blind man? He was a blind beggar. He wasn't worthy of anything. He was a wild olive tree. But he got healed. He had faith that he was the son of God. That's what was lacking in these Pharisees, Pharisees and Sadducees, these natural, pruned, righteous branches, so-called. They didn't get the kingdom. And so when the chief priests and Pharisees had heard his parables, they perceived that he spoke of them. They're not stupid guys, are they? And they sought, they sought to lay hands on him and, and kill him. Look back at Matthew 12, verse 32. When did the identification of these branches, when did the cutting off, when did God label these branches worthy of cutting off? In his ministry, back here. When did he identify the branches that were going to get the kingdom? Back in his earthly ministry here. Okay. Who did he give the Holy Ghost? Who did he give the commission that he was given by the Lord in John 17? His 12 apostles. All right. The remnant, the little flock. Matthew 12, verse 32 says, Whosoever speaks a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But whosoever speaks against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven him, either in this world, neither in the world to come. Either make the tree good and his fruit good, or else make the tree corrupt and his fruit corrupt. For the tree is known by his fruit. When do they speak against the Holy Ghost? When does Israel get witnessed to by the Holy Ghost? And they go, not doing that. Peter's ministry, right? Acts 2, Acts 3, Acts 4, Acts 5, Acts 7, Stephen filled with the Holy Ghost. They stone the guy, right? Branches are cut off. You already had branches grafted in. You already had those wild guys saying, you got the kingdom now. And those branches are tagged for cutting off, and they get cut off, and they blast from the Holy Ghost there in Acts 12, 32. He's talking about the fruit. O generation of vipers, how can ye being evil speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Didn't we cover that in Romans 10? You have to confess them with your mouth. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. That's where they stumbled back there. That's where they were cut off. So go back to Romans 11, verse 24. We're talking about a grafted wild olive tree, which has to do with people who are wild, whether they be fishermen and tax collectors, or whether they be Gentiles. Okay, And they both get by faith what those Pharisees and Sadducees did not, that Jesus denied them, okay? And, of course, that all happened before Paul even was saved. <laughs> all this happened before the Revelation ministry was revealed to Paul. This is not the main theme of Paul's ministry. This is Paul explaining what happened to Israel, okay, before he even got saved, right? And, by the way, he's apt to do that because he, being the apostle of the Gentiles, knowing the station of the grace of God, knowing the importance of faith and grace, is able to clearly identify why they stumbled. Right? Just like you're apt to teach. All right? So 
but we will stop there, and uh, next week we'll finish the chapter. Any questions about that?